Okay, so we're recording. Uh, welcome to Monday's lecture. Uh, we're going to spend today mostly reviewing uh, the midterm on Saturday and any time left we're going to do some practice questions from the energy unit before moving on to the momentum unit. Uh, before we start taking up the midterm, there's some kind of remarks I want to make about the midterm. Um, I usually do this every year, not just with an online class. And, uh, you know, pretty much what happened after the midterm, uh, you know, Saturday afternoon is, is a fairly typical behavior of what normally happens after an in-person midterm as well. You know, a lot of students uh, were saying, oh, this one was way harder than last year, um, longer than last year. You know, hindsight is always 2020. Um, all Every time, you know, we post past midterms, which by the way, I'll remind you is a something that's optional like we don't have to post past midterms i've chosen to do that so you know please don't make me regret doing that um students always will comment that last year's midterm was way easier than this year's midterm when in fact very rarely is that the case uh you know most instructors myself included we, we go to great lengths to ensure that the difficulty of the course from year to year is the same um you know we, we try very hard to make to make sure courses don't get harder over time or, or, or get easier over time, although in general the courses do in fact get easier over time whether students think they do or not. So I just wanted to say that uh, there were a similar number of marks between this year's midterm and previous midterms. I think last year's midterm had 70 marks, this one, this one had 64, so we we're within margin of error of, of one another. Um, yeah, there may have been uh, more questions, but you know, you can't, you can't equate, you know, one question for another question. Um, if you look at the, the full solution questions on previous midterms, they were definitely longer. They were worth 15 marks, maybe, you know, more than 11, I guess is what I'm saying. So they're, they're more involved, they're more difficult. So, you know, if, if our full solution questions were worth 11 marks, then there's fewer parts to do. And, you know, over, over the course of three full solution questions, if each of those is slightly shorter, then we've got room for another question or, or a half a question. So, you know, there's that. Um, the other thing I'll say is, uh, you know, as, as this year's with, with all the previous years, students who were well prepared and have done a proper amount of homework after each lecture, as I've been encouraging, you know, they, they do, I, I just go home after the lecture, open the textbook, you should be doing at least an hour of homework after the lecture, just to make sure when all the concepts are fresh, you practice them when, when everything's fresh. Um, you know, even if you attend lecture for that matter, I mean, I, I noticed I silently noticed, I didn't mention it, that uh, we're, we're getting, you know, roughly only a third of the students showing up to lecture. Um, I mean, even now there's only 72 students uh, live at the moment, and there's about 160 students enrolled in the class. So just to kind of throw that number out there now. And yes, I know there are some international students who, who may not be able to view these lectures live. I understand that, but they by no means make up half of the course there there's only a, a small handful of them that are abroad and are in this category so that just means most of the students are simply aren't attending lecture and that definitely will contribute to your performance on on a test so please keep that in mind as well before you claim that the tests were too long or too hard you know you, you, you students have to take a responsibility for their learning as well if they're not putting in the time and the effort they can't simply say that the tests were too long or too too uh, too hard um, rest assured, you know, there is, there was nothing tricky about this test. All, all of the questions were very doable if students attended lecture and did practice. As you will see when we take them up, the solution, there, there's nothing complicated about the solutions here. Um, everything we've gone over in lecture multiple times um, was definitely reflected in the assignments, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, on a more positive note, um, I will say that uh, each student should have had mostly a different set of multiple choice questions. Um, I picked them all, uh, I tried to pick them all myself just because I was trying to curb some of the communication and collaboration during an online test. Uh, usually with tests, you know, when they're done in person, we don't, like everyone can have the same test, right? Because we're watching everyone, you know, you're not necessarily talking or using Google. Uh, with an online test, uh, that's obviously harder to monitor. So with multiple choice questions, I chose to uh, have, have every student have different multiple choice questions to help curb some of that communication with each other. 
And uh, as a result, and this was a huge task for me to do. I mean, there's 160 kids in the class and each of you mostly had a different bank of, of questions. So that's a huge volume of questions. And I, there are probably typos in the solution keys uh, every now and then. I know I've had a, a small handful of students, three or four students over the weekend, uh, sending me an email saying, um, you know, the, the, the typed feedback uh, seems to indicate that my selected my selected answer was in fact correct, even though it was marked wrong. And um, you're absolutely correct in those cases. I mean, it's just it's a matter of like my my typing was correct, my feedback was correct when I was typing an answer, but you know I I don't know I, I overlooked changing the the default answer key to something else. So um, if please I, I take five minutes, kind of look over the solution keys for your multiple choice questions. And uh, if there's anything that kind of looks out of place, just drop me an email and I'll sort it out. Um, you know, if in the event that you think something's out of place, but actually there, there was no typo, uh, my response will just, you know, try, try to explain to you kind of what the answer is and why. That way you just, your, your learning is, is improved that way too. I won't just simply say, no, you're wrong. I'll, I'll try to explain kind of where, why it wasn't a typo. But anyway, anyone who's emailed me so far, um, you've been absolutely correct. There. There's been a typo. So thank you. Thank you guys for emailing me for that one. Um, okay. Um, I think those are all the notes I really have about the midterm. Um, you'll see that the solutions are really not overly involved when we start, when we start taking it up. So um, without further ado, let's, let's take up the first question, um, the first non-multiple choice question, I should say. So this is actually based on a true story. Um, last year, I think it was last year, maybe it was the year before, um, Marc Garneau, he's French, obviously you can tell from the name, so same spelling as my name. Uh, he is a Canadian astronaut that was in fact in space and he did go up in the rocket. Uh, it was a really cool story. He came in to chat as a guest, as a guest speaker to my, one of my physics classes, I think it was last year or two years ago. And uh, really cool. He's now the, the federal minister of transportation, which I find absolutely hilarious. I mean, an astronaut is probably the most hilarious choice of person you could make for a federal minister of transportation. Um, anyway, uh, he came in to talk to the kids kind of about, and his background is in physics. I think he's, um, I think he's uh, perhaps an engineer. I'd have to look it up, but he, he is, his background is in physics. So he was talking to the kids kind of about, um, you know, how everyone thinks um, rocket science or space physics is, you know, difficult in, in, in everyday language, you know, they always say, like, oh, it's not complicated, it's not rocket science. And he was trying to address kind of that, that myth. So he was explaining to my students kind of how easy space physics is. And uh, I mean, it, he's correct, quite frankly, uh, space physics is relatively easy compared to what we deal with on Earth. But um, you know, maybe he was just nervous talking to a bunch of uh, physicists and a bunch of, a bunch of physics profs were also sitting in the room. So maybe he was just nervous about getting things technically correct. I don't know. I, I absolutely do not hold anything against him. Um, great guy. But anyway, he was saying things like, um, when you do space physics, uh, everywhere you have g in your equations, you can just set g equal to zero. You know, because there's no gravity in space. And uh, he said, you know, you you're used to in, in physics. You know, you do a lot of questions with friction or, um, you know, you have to assume friction is equal to zero. We've done that a lot in this class. You know, we do questions, we say neglecting air friction or neglecting friction, or we assume it's a frictionless slide. He's saying in, in, in space, you don't necessarily have to uh, assume that there's no friction. In fact, it is true that there's no friction. So um, I kind of described that in the question and I asked students to comment uh, kind of on, on the technical correctness of Mark Garneau's uh, reasons for why space physics is easier. And uh, I will start by saying that his comments about setting gravity equal to zero is in fact uh, very wrong. Um, if we look at the at Newton's law of gravity, we know Newton's law of gravity is g m1 m2 over r squared, which means any two objects will exert a force of gravity on one another, regardless of how far they are away from each other. As r gets bigger, of course, the force of gravity gets smaller. That's that's true, but there's nothing inherently about being in space that just magically makes gravity equal to zero. And we talked about this a little bit when we, when we studied or did um, uh, gravitational and, and um, planetary orbits. We had this notion of, of weightlessness. Weightlessness. Um, and weightlessness is, is not 
that gravity doesn't exist. It's that there's a sensation in our brain that gravity doesn't exist. And this comes from the fact that there is no normal force. Our brain senses us having weight by the normal force. And we've talked about this when we did circular motion and when we did the pilot doing the loop-de-loop. -loop. You know, at the bottom of the loop-de-loop -loop, when he's coming, you know, out of the nosedive or when you're on a, a roller coaster and you come down um, straight, straight. I just realized my camera's off. Um, there we go. Um, well, when you're at the bottom, when you're coming down at the bottom of, um, of a roller coaster, um, you do a nosedive on the roller coaster and then at the, at the bottom of the drop, you kind of pull out of it and you feel heavier when it's pulling out of the nosedive and you feel heavier because you have an increased normal force on your body. So we, we've discussed how weight, uh, apparent weight is actually the normal force and not solely a result of, of gravity. So um, some, some answer, uh, a concise answer, one or two sentences, explaining that Mark Garneau was technically incorrect in that you cannot just simply set gravity equal to zero. Um, however, you can set normal force equal to zero. So anything that has an apparent weight uh, resulting from having a normal force will not have a, an apparent weight. So that's how you answer that one. Um, his comments about there, there not being friction is correct. Um, there's no atmosphere in space, so there's no, there's no air resistance. We don't, you know, on Earth, we often assume we neglect air resistance, even though there is air resistance. But in space, that's not an assumption, it's just a fact. And, um, you know, when you're, let's say you have a, an astronaut that's just sort of standing on the International Space Station, like outside in their, in their uh, astronaut suit, um, there's no normal force. So even though their feet are, are physically touching the space station, there's no normal force. So there's no friction. If, if they were to try to walk forward, they wouldn't be able to walk anywhere because friction is mu fn. And if there's no normal force, there's no force of friction. So um, he was correct on, on that front. Okay, uh, moving on. And now, one, oh, there we go. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, the next question. Uh, it asks students to refer to the circular motion, um, circular motion notes. So I thought this was kind of a fun question because it is an online test and we don't necessarily have this opportunity very often. Uh, normally, like uh, regular tests are kind of closed book and in, uh, in person and you know, you can't use your notes, but I thought I would lean into it a little bit now that we do have this kind of unique platform and uh, you know, have a fun question where I had you piggyback, uh, expand upon a worked example in the lecture notes. I thought that would be a, a fun thing to do. So in the lecture notes, um, this question said that the required mu value to have a car uh, successfully turn a corner, uh, a banked curve specifically, would be V squared minus RG tan theta over V squared tan theta plus RG. And in the question, it said the car was traveling, it was known to be traveling too fast for the, for the banking angle. So we know in the question that the critical velocity uh, was, le oops, was less than the actual velocity of the car, meaning the velocity of the car was larger than the critical velocity. So friction would be down the ramp, trying to keep it uh, on the ramp and not sliding up, up, up and away. And uh, given all the values in the question, the mu value required was 0 0.7. And the actual mu value between the tires on the road was 0 0.5. So the fact that the required friction to keep this car on the road uh, was larger than what it could actually provide, meaning uh, 0 0.7 was larger than 0 0.5, the conclusion in the question, uh, or in the worked example in the, uh, in the type notes, was that the car, would slide off the ramp. And so that was a fun little question. And, uh, but then it dawned on me, like in real life, how do you, how do you really measure the speed of a car? You know, um, if the person driving the car could just look at their speedometer, that's true. But, you know, physics is an experimental science. So, you know, uh, in some way, someone has to be taking a measurement of this moving car. And as you've been doing in your labs, you're realizing that every measurement you touch will have an associated uncertainty with it. 
So I thought it would be a nice question to do, you know, what if, what if hypothetically there was uh, an uncertainty in this car's speed because of instrument error, you know, when the, when the police are sitting on the side of the road and they have a little radar gun uh, and they shoot the little radar gun, uh, there's an uncertainty in the number that that radar gun gives you, right? Because it's an instrument. Now, it might be a very small uncertainty, but it's an uncertainty nonetheless. So this question was, well, let's assume there's an uncertainty in the velocity of six meters per second and an uncertainty in the radius of, of two meters. Uh, what, what would the uncertainty on the mu value be? And does this mean we are no longer able to confidently say the car will crash? Um, you know, if, if there's enough uncertainty, then it might very well be that the mu value isn't 0 0.7. Maybe the required mu value is, is within the proper threshold and it won't crash. So let's, uh, let's go through it. Um, now, there's two ways to do this. You can do the full-blown one um, and, and propagate the uncertainty uh, using bed mass one by one. And I'll set that up for you just so you can see kind of what the starting equation looks like. But um, if, if students practice their, their number sense and their numeracy skills, they'll quickly realize that the uncertainty in the radius is actually far smaller than the uncertainty in the speed. And you can, since the, the answer for the uncertainty is only one, one significant digit anyway, um, you, as long as the uncertainty in the radius is, is very, very, very small in comparison, you can approximate the radius to be a precise value. And you can just do the calculation with the uncertainty and velocity, and it simplifies it quite a bit. So uh, students who have practiced this, um, you know, would have been able to be well prepared for the question. And students who didn't practice as much would have still been able to do it, it just would have taken them longer. But that just comes with the territory of, of not practicing as much as, as the students who do practice more. So we follow the, the uh, formula here. So we see two terms on the numerator. So first we have to calculate the uncertainty, oops, sorry. First we have to calculate the uncertainty in v squared. So according to the formula on the uh, formula sheet that I gave you, the uncertainty in the square of the velocity is going to be 2 times v times delta v. So 2 times v times delta v is going to be uh, 2 times 89.4 times 6. And this works itself out to be an uncertainty value of plus or minus 1073 meters squared per second squared. And uh, that's the uncertainty in v squared. Uh, the next one is we have another term. So we need to know the uncertainty in g r tan theta. And the uncertainty in g r tan theta, well, g is a constant, theta is a constant. So really, this is like the, um, a constant times the uncertainty in r. So the constant is g times tan theta, and the uncertainty in r is what, uh, two? So g tan th theta is what, 33? Um, tan of 33 is around tan of 30. Tan of 30 is one over root three. Um, g is around 10. 10 over root three is gonna be about five. Five times two is 10. So this is gonna be around 10. I think the real answer is 13. But um, this is this is a ballpark a ballpark number. But the, the real answer if you use a calculator is, is 13. Um, next up, we have the uncertainty in v squared minus rg tan theta. Um, so this is going to be uh, we're adding and subtracting two numbers, which means we use the adding and subtracting formula. So this says it's going to be the uncertainty in v squared squared plus the uncertainty in g r tan theta squared, all square rooted. So we know what these values are. These values are 1073 squared plus 13 squared. And this is what I was saying earlier. You can see here that 13 is, is far less than 1,700, uh, sorry, 1,073. So let alone when you square them, that difference becomes even more significant. So you can actually just say, you know, this is going to be approximately the square root of 1073 squared, which is simply 1073. And if you actually do the math with a calculator, um, you'll notice the answer it, with a calculator is still 1073. 
uh, I have inevitably run out of space. So let's do this, uh, add more space again. Uh, I don't know why it didn't add more space. Let's just move this down maybe. Oop, nope. All right, this is fun. All right. There we go. Okay, so we have the uncertainty in the numerator. The uncertainty in the numerator is 1,700 and, sorry, 1,073. Uh, moving on, we now have to look at the uncertainty in the denominator, and we can do something similar. You'll notice that the denominator uh, has the form v squared tan theta plus rg, and uh, tan theta is a constant, so you know you, you calculate the uncertainty. We have the uncertainty on v squared, so the uncertainty on v squared tan theta is simply tan theta times the uncertainty in v squared. And that works out to be 700. And then we have the uncertainty in rg, which is g times the uncertainty in r, right? Because r, g is a constant, so the uncertainty in r times g is just a constant times the uncertainty. And this works out to be uh, 20. And again here we have a, an addition, so we use the addition formula, so the uncertainty in the denominator is going to be the square root of 700 squared plus 20 squared. And again you'll notice that because the uncertainty in R is, is substantially smaller compared to that of, of um, speed, then you know when you put everything, if you do everything the real way, um, you'll, you'll realize you just kind of wasted your time that you could have gotten away with an approximation. So, you know, 700 squared is far bigger than 20 squared, which is only 400. So this is still going to be 700 here as well. Um, lastly, we now have, we have the uncertainty of the numerator and denominator separately. So the uncertainty in mu is simply going to be mu times the uncertainty in the numerator over the numerator squared plus the uncertainty in the denominator over the denominator squared, all square rooted. And you'll see that, um, well, you fill in all the numbers, you're going to get um, 1073 over, now if you plug in all the values for the numerator, I think you're going to get 5,800 and 60 and 700 over, if you plug in all the values in the denominator, you get 8,372. And then mu 0.7 times all this stuff. So when you do this, you're going to end up getting 0.2. So your uncertainty in mu, oops, your uncertainty in the mu value is 0 0.2. Now this means your mu value is no longer 0 0.7, it's 0 0.7 plus or minus 0 0.2, which means this could, this could equal uh, 0.5. The, the 0.5 is the low end uh, the, of the uncertainty range. So technically, 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 and the answer to this question is we are not confidently able to say that the car will crash. However, um, you know, technically, I, I would I would not feel comfortable in real life because you know, the acceptable friction is right on the low end, like right on the bottom end of the uh, of the uncertainty range. So, you know, I would still probably recommend to the driver to slow down, but technically the answer to this question is no, we can no longer confidently say that the car will crash because it might just be the required friction um, is in fact 0.5 instead of 0.7. Um, this one is just an estimation question. Um, if you don't have a calculator, what value would you report? Um, this is just a simple order of magnitude uh, calculation. Um, you know, mu, oh boy, it's a terrible mu. We know the formula v squared minus rg tan theta. Well, v squared 
is, well, what was V? It was like 89 point something. That's a messy number. You know, we can assume V, well, right here, we can assume V is around 100. Um, we can assume R, what was R? I think it was like 330 something meters. Again, messy number. So the closest, the closest power of 10 would be 300. Um, and theta was equal to 33. Oops, sorry. Uh, technically, theta was 33, but uh, we don't know tan of 33, but we do know tan of 30. So we can assume um, theta is equal to 30. So if we plug in everything there, we're going to get 100 squared minus um, RG tan theta R. G, oh yeah, we can assume G is around 10. And then tan, tan theta all over v squared tan theta plus r g. So those are the uh, approximated values, the order of magnitude calculation values. So you'd get a few marks for doing that correctly. And then when you plug all the numbers in and you simplify, um, you end up getting the number one. Um, specifically, I think you end up getting two times 10 to the four over two times 10 to the four, which simplifies to one. So you might seem like, oh yeah, one is very different than 0 0.5. Well, bear in mind the answer wasn't 0 0.5. The answer for the values uh, in the example question number nine was mu is 0 0.7. So getting an approximate value without using a calculator of, of one, that's pretty close. You know, 0 0.7 and one are pretty close. Both of which, might I add, are you know definitely above the threshold of 0.5. So you know, if, if, you know, you're just watching the car kind of travel and, you know, buddy goes, Hey Mark, you know, you think that car is going to make it? And you're like, well, I don't have a calculator, but it looks like that car is going around hundred meters a second. And it looks like the radius of curvature is around 300, the banking angle is around 30. No, I don't think the car is going to make it, you know, cause I would, I would approximate a mu value of one, which might be not technically accurate, right? The answer was 0 0.7, but, you know, if, if I'm approximating a value of one, it's substantially above 0 0.5. So I'm like, all right, look, I, I know it's an approximate value, but it's, it's not that bad. You know, it's not 100% uncertainty. So anyway, that's the answer to that one. Uh, the next question was a full solution question. Uh, it's a fairly standard pulley question. Um, we did a lot of uh, pulley questions in lecture. You had some pulley questions on the assignment, and I encourage you to practice the pulley questions. Um, you know, no, not that much different here. Uh, this question says, uh, we have the mass of this guy, we have the mass of this guy, we do not have the mass of, of mass C. Um, assuming we want a desired acceleration of two meters per second squared, um, what does the mass of mass C have to be to achieve uh, a mass, uh, sorry, to achieve an acceleration of two meters per second squared? So um, again, there's two ways to do this question. Uh, students who would have practiced and become familiar with the physics uh, would have been able to take some shortcuts, sanctioned shortcuts. Um, students who are still shaky and maybe didn't do enough homework, um, they would have been having to do this uh, a little bit longer. Um, the long way is you would draw out three separate free body diagrams. You do free body diagram of A, and you'd write gravity down here, and you'd write tension one up there. Um, and then you do oh, free body diagram of A. And then free body diagram of B, you have tension two, tension one. You have the force of friction backwards, gravity down, normal force up. And then the free body diagram for C, uh, is very similar to A. You have the force of gravity of C, or I should label these A, B, C, and then you'd have tension two upward. So you have three free body diagrams. We're asking for mass. So mass would be an unknown, one unknown. Um, tension one is an unknown, so that's sec two unknowns, and then tension two is an unknown, so that's three unknowns, three free body diagrams. You're gonna have an answer. Um, it'll just take you a little bit longer to get there. Um, for those of you who've, who've done uh, uh, a sufficient amount of, of practice problems in the homework, you'll realize that you could actually combine all the masses into one free body diagram and uh, simply 
do uh, write all of the external forces on the on the mass or on the system. So internal forces would be like tension, right? Tension pulls block A up and and block B to the left, right? So you know they're they're within the system. It's like you know you're uh, the force of tension in your ligaments. You know when you when you're studying the physics on the body, you know how fast can you run? You know you you very rarely label all the internal forces in your body, right? It's only the external forces acting on you uh, as a whole body. So um, for instance, uh, gravity from mass A is pulling to the left uh, uh, counterclockwise. Uh, friction, the force of friction from block B is also pulling counterclockwise. And the only thing pulling uh, clockwise is the force of gravity from block C. So you kind of have this tug of war between um, the external forces and all, and all the internal forces will eventually cancel. So you could set up your free body diagram like this and then your F net is simply going to be MCG minus MAG minus mu MBG equals the total mass of the system times the acceleration. And the total mass of the system is M1, no, MA plus MB plus MC times A. And that would equal the left hand side. So going through this, we have G, we have MA, we have G, we have mu, we have MB, we have G, we have MA, we've got MB, and we have A. So the only thing we're missing in this one equation is MC and MC. So uh, all you'd have to do is rearrange this equation to solve for MB and you get your answer. Um, if you did rearrange for MB, I think the formula, not MB, sorry, uh, MC. If you did rearrange for MC, I think the formula you get would be MC is equal to MA times A plus G plus MB A plus mu KG all over G minus A. So there would be your final derived equation solving for MC. And then you plug in your numbers. Once you plug in all your numbers, I think you end up getting something like 13 kilograms. So there's two ways to do the question. One way would have taken slightly longer. Um, this way would have been slightly uh, shorter. But before you all yell at me saying, well, that's unfair, um, if you did do it the long way, you will have indirectly already answered part C. So when you hit part C, um, you would have already had an answer to part C. Whereas if you did it the short way for part A, you'd have had to go back and do it the long way anyway for part C. Uh, the second question is more of a concept. Without doing any calculations, explain whether the two ropes will have the same tension um, using physics concepts from class. Um, there are different ropes, obviously. They're, they're on, on either end of, of a mass. So yes, they're attached to the same mass, but they are different ropes. So what I said in class was if it's the same rope, it'll have the same tension in the rope. But if they're different ropes, there's nothing that says different ropes have to have the same tension within the system. Um, if you're trying to think of an intuitive way to think about that, you know, you've got all these sort of muscles and tendons and ligaments in your body. When you, when you move forward, when you, when you walk forward, um, you know, certain muscles engage and ligaments engage. So there's gonna be different amounts of tension in one ligament compared to a ligament somewhere else in your body. Right? All the ligaments are acting on the same object, like your body, but if they're different ligaments, then they're, they're, they're absolutely nothing that says they have to have the same amount of tension in them. They might by fluke have the same tension in them, but there's nothing that says they have to. So the answer to this one um, would be, um, they are different ropes, thus will have potentially different tensions. Now, the way we can conclude that there are, they are definitely a different amount of tension is that since the acceleration does not equal zero, we know that, um, that tension one will not equal tension two. Because if tension one did equal tension two, 
um, the middle object wouldn't move, right? The net force would be zero. So um, we know that the middle object does accelerate, so the two tensions can't possibly be equal to each other. And then part C is actually finding the tensions. And again, if you did it the long way in part A, you would already have this information. You could literally just say from part A, here's the formula, here's my value. Um, from part A, um, if you did do it the long way, you'll see that the free body diagram for A, tension one, force of gravity on A, quite simply, if you do F net equals MA on that, you're gonna get tension one minus MAG equals MA times acceleration. So the tension one is gonna be MAG plus A, which I think ends up getting you somewhere around 47.2 Newtons. And uh, you do something similar for all of them. Free body diagram for C, for instance, you have force of gravity C going down, you've got tension two going up. So when you do F net equals MA, um, here, the acceleration we know is downwards because the whole system is rotating uh, clockwise. So um, if, you make, if you make down positive, then this is gonna be the force of gravity down is positive, tension is upward, so it's negative, equals mass C times acceleration. So the tension two is gonna be MC G minus A. And I think this ends up uh, being something like 100.6 newtons, something along those lines. And then you do something similar for, for the middle block as well. Actually, you don't need to do the middle block because it's the same two ropes. So that's the answer for that one. Uh, moving right along, the second full solution question. Um, again, you can tell that these have a story to them and unfortunately I can't deny their truth. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I've been doing physics for far too long and I, I see the world, every, everything I look at, I see through a physics lens. I mean, I see free body diagrams everywhere. Well, when I don't want to do my work and I procrastinate, I often zone out thinking about the physics of very simple things in life. And, um, you know, if you've ever had to do your own laundry, you've probably never thought about this, but you know, when I do my own laundry, I just watch it kind of tumble and, uh, I just think of the physics, I guess, of, of doing your laundry, because that's how weird I am and how much of a nerd I am. So this question is, is a, a circular motion question, but applied to an everyday, relatively everyday thing like doing your laundry. So um, the question explains that there's, you know, a, a washing machine that spins the clothes really, really, really fast. And then the dryer, when the dryer operates, the dryer spins the clothes, but very slowly. And, um, you know, they're obviously very deliberate values. I mean, I, I can understand two different washing machines may spin their, their, their clothes at different speeds, depending on the brand, right? Um, but you can tell like every washing machine is designed to spin clothes fast and every dryer is designed to spin clothes slowly. So the first question is to really have students think about, you know, why, like what, what physics went into this design? Why, why is one designed to be fast? Why is one designed to be slow? So um, a dryer, a dryer is designed to spin slow because the whole goal of a dryer is to use hot air blowing in the drum to dry the clothes. So if it was, if it was spinning fast, like, like in, the, um, in the washing machine, all the clothes would just get shoved radially outward uh, and pressed against the drum. So the only part of the clothes that would dry if, it, if the dryer was spinning too fast would be the part of the clothes facing inwards, right? The, that, those would be the part of the clothes that are touching the dry air. When the dryer is spinning slowly, the clothes do not complete the full circle, right? They, they're traveling in uniform circular motion, but they don't really they don't really travel uh, the full circle. You know, they get most of the way to the top and then, and then they drop. Now in real life, there's a little bit more to the story. Um, there is static friction between the clothes and the, um, and the, uh, and the drum. Um, the drum also has little wings that kind of jet out to provide a bit of a normal force to, to kind of help them along. Um, these are all energy saving things. You know, that if you, if you include friction and you include the little the platforms inside the drum that allows the drum to spin slower and still get the clothes to tumble. 
whereas if you don't include friction, you don't include the wings, you'd have to use more electricity to make the drums spin a little bit faster to get them to tumble. So uh, we won't do the full blown physics, right? This was a simplified version. This, this question, uh, the answer to part A is just, uh, you want the clothes to tumble, right? You do not want them pushed up against the drum. You want them to tumble. And then that way the hot air can get, get at all sides of the clothes. That way they can dry. And then why is a washing machine designed to be fast? Um, they do that on purpose because they use the washing machine as a centrifuge, which a lot of you have heard of from other science courses like biology and chemistry. Uh, when the washing machine spins really fast, the, the well, I guess in, in chemistry, when you use a centrifuge, the heavier particles kind of get quote unquote pushed to the outside. That's what chemists would call, call centrifugal force. Uh, when you're dealing with clothes, there is no heavy particles per se, but water, water is very heavy. So when you spin the, the drum of the washing machine really, really fast, it acts like a centrifuge and it actually uh, pushes a lot of the loose water out. And that's why the, the drum in a washing machine has holes in it. It allows the water to get thrown outwards and then a pump will pump it out. And again, they do this for energy efficient reasons. You know, this gets a lot of the excess water out of the clothes. It's analogous to wringing the clothes out by hand before hanging them up to dry. Um, they're using physics to wring out, wring out the clothes. And that way when you put them in the dryer, the dryer doesn't have to run for six hours. It only has to run for like half an hour or 40 minutes. Um, B is where all the physics happened. Um, part A was uh, testing this, the students' ability to take, take what they've learned in physics and see if they can explain the world around them, right? Because ultimately that's what we're trying to do with, when, when teaching you physics is we're trying to explain the world around us. So that was part A. Part B is um, just do some, do some physics, good old fashioned physics. So what is the maximum frequency of rotation that a dryer is allowed to rotate at so that the clothes are still allowed to tumble. Of course, if the dryer rotated too fast, it would physically rotate, like it wouldn't break the dryer. It's just the clothes would just get pressed up against the drum. So uh, there's inherently a maximum speed at which it can rotate. Anything faster than that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't the dryer would not work as designed. So let's, um, let's approach that. So the key here, the key is we want, the clothes to fall um, at the top or on the verge, I should say, on the verge of falling. This happens when the normal force at the top is equal to zero. So if you draw the drum, the object at the bottom will have the force of gravity and the normal force, obviously, but at the top, the goal is at the top, we only want gravity coming down and no normal force. And we've done some questions like this in lecture. You should have seen them in homework if you had been doing enough homework as I recommended. There's lots of questions in the textbook that have this scenario. And we also explicitly did talk about the scenario um, in lecture as well. So that's our goal is we're setting F, F normal to be zero at the top, that's our key. So um, if you draw your free body diagram at the top, as I mentioned in that bigger diagram to the right, our only force is our force of gravity. I'm not labeling um, centripetal force because as I mentioned in lecture, there is no such thing as centripetal force. Um, we talked about the moon circling, cir uh, orbiting the earth. Even though there's a forward velocity, velocity is not a force, right? Even though these clothes are in the middle of traveling in a circle, and they're traveling forward, that's a velocity, that's inertia, that's not a force. The only force acting on this, on this article of clothing at the top is specifically gravity. So here we go to F net equals MA. We make note that we're traveling in circular motion, so it's MAC, and then we just move right along with our analysis. So the net force we can see is the force of gravity, and that's gonna equal MV squared over R, mass, gravity equals mv squared over r, the mass is cancel. So here we see that gravity equals v squared over r. And we could be done, however, you'll notice the question asks for frequency. So we need to find a way to introduce frequency. Um, you'll remember this discussion from lecture, hopefully, 
but the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. So um, in uniform circular motion, the speed of the object around the circle is constant. The velocity vector is constantly changing. That's, that's where you get the acceleration from, but the speed is constant. So we can use the equation v equals d over t. And the displacement of the, an article of clothing in circular motion is going to be the circumference, 2 pi r, and the time it takes to complete one full 2 pi r, one, one full um, circumference, is going to be the period t. And we know, and th this could be our, you know, our formula, but again, the, the question does not ask for period, it asks for frequency. So we know period and frequency are inverses of, an, of one another, so we get 2 pi r f. So there you go. I think I believe this formula was also on your formula sheet. So you can swap out uh, speed here for 2 pi r f squared over r, and then that gets you 4 pi squared r f squared. So there's your final equation. Um, so that'll get you some points there. And then you've got to go through and uh, plug in your values. And if you go through and plug in your values, I think you get something like 0 0.88 hertz. Uh, well, sorry, I should say f equals. You've got to rearrange for f because this this equals g. Don't forget. So um, you might you might say actually if you rearrange for f, actually here let me let me do that here. If you rearrange for f, f is going to equal root g over 4 pi squared r. And then that's going to equal 0 0.88 hertz. That's a terrible z. OK, so that's that question. Nothing tricky there. It's uh, a very, I mean, if you look at the number of steps taken, I mean, free body diagram, f net equals ma, um, v squared over r, all things that are very standard. Um, and then after you expand fg, uh, it's really just a matter of rearranging a formula, which is grade nine math. So there's, there's nothing too complicated with that question either. Um, now this one, unfortunately, no, not unfortunately, this one luckily is, is not uh, born out of real life. Um, I have absolutely zero interest in guns. Um, you know, I, I don't know what America's thinking with their, with their gun control laws. I don't mean to get political, but um, maybe I'm just biased because I'm Canadian. I don't know. But I am absolutely thankful that um, gun control is uh, definitely a thing in Canada. So I have absolutely no interest in, in guns at all, but they do make for interesting physics problems. So this question here says that if you have a target at a certain altitude, um, if you were to fire a, a bullet, uh, at the bullseye directly, so it's kind of lined up with the bullseye, um, it, it actually wouldn't hit the bullseye, right? Because the bullet is a projectile. So we know the trajectory of a projectile is parabolic, right? And this was hinted at in the, um, in the assignment, uh, question four of the assignment, and um, well, all parts of the assignment, quite frankly, but um, specifically question four. So we, we did have question four marked on assignment one. And uh, so you had feedback, marking feedback on uh, for question four on assignment one. And one of the questions on, on there was, you know, if, if I'm aiming at a window, Bill Gates's window was, you can tell I don't like windows, but <laughs> if I'm aiming at Bill Gates's window, um, do I aim the rock straight at the window? Or do I aim kind of above the window, below the window, and, and why? So there was a hint on that assignment that uh, it was more of a concept question on the assignment. This was actually the physics and, and actually having you calculate uh, the, the implications of the concept in a physics problem. So it's very related to the assignment we had everyone do and, and, and the question we had Mark and the feedback that you had on that and you know, very related to the solutions we had posted for it. So it's a very, very straightforward, fair question. Um, if I if I fire the bullet kind of in line, then it will fall a distance h below the target. So if I wanted to hit the bullseye, obviously I would have to kind of raise the gun in the air, and then that way when it's fired, it kind of falls and then hits hits the bullseye that way. 
So the question was asking for how far above the bullseye do you have to hold the gun? And uh, again, if you do not have enough practice with projectile motion, this might seem like a hard question. But students were encouraged almost every lecture to go home and, you know, do some practice problems. So, um, you know, the, for the students who were well practiced, this should have been a piece of cake, you know, a, a five minute question. And uh, I budgeted 15 minutes for this. So I was even uh, accounting for students who hadn't practiced a lot. Uh, if you had practiced, like I said, this should be like a five minute question, a, a well, a well practiced student, this should have been a very fast question. So um, going through here, we notice that um, the, the concept here is that for every, for every second that goes by, um, it falls, it falls down. So we need to know how long does it take or how long does a bullet have to fall? And um, so step one is to find, find the time of flight. How long does it take, uh, how long is it allowed to fall? And that time is governed by when the bullet reaches the, the, um, the target, whether it be hitting the bullseye or maybe I'm just a bad shot and miss, miss the target altogether. Either way, um, you use the x direction for this. And we say that vx equals dx over t. So the time of flight is going to be the time it takes, oops, the time it takes for the bullet to reach the target. So um, that's the time right there, d over v. Now I, I say vx, there's really only one speed, right? The initial speed of the bullet's horizontal. So v equals vx in this case, but those are just semantics. So now we have the time of flight. Now we could, step two is how far does the bullet fall in this time? And we are running out of space. So how far does the bullet fall in this time? Well, this we can use delta dy equals v1 y t minus one half g t squared. And we're solving for this. So delta dy we can call height. There is no speed in the y direction initially. So v1 y is equal to zero. So this gives us, oh, sorry, delta dy is, um, is negative h because it's downwards. I have inherently let down be negative. So uh, it falls down, so h is negative. And then minus one half g t squared. So this tells me that h is equal to one half g, what was t? t was distance over speed. So there you go. So that's how far the bullet falls um, during the path. Right, during its its uh, travels toward the the um, the bullseye. So if I want to hit the bullseye, I have to hold the hold the gun this many meters. Oh boy, this many meters above the bullseye. So uh, as you can see in the solutions, it's a, it's a fairly short solution. You know, first you find uh, the time and then you find um, the height. It's two very simple formulas. Um, quite frankly, uh, the midterms from the other instructor in September, um, Wagi Gobriel's midterms, uh, his full solution questions are much more involved. Uh, much, 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 much more involved. There's many more steps. Um, you know, they're, they're much more difficult problems. Um, so. I'm a little bit surprised students are, are trying to claim that his tests are easier because objectively speaking, the physics in his tests are, are much harder than these. Once you see these solutions spelled out, it's like one, two steps and you're actually done. Um, anyway, moving on. The last question um, should not have come as a shock to you. Um, I posted all my, past, all my past midterms and you'll see that on every single one of my past midterms, there's a, a sort of a little challenge question at the end and it's not worth a lot of points. And um, this, this really gives the strong students the ability to shine. You know, um, it, a well-designed test should, should have this built into it. You know, a, a certain number of, of marks on a test should be easily accessible 
to, uh, to, to the majority of the average student. And then there should always be a few marks that are, you know, uh, the only strong students who have practiced a you know, lot and, you know, are really sharp and, you know, really familiar with the material. Um, now, by no means should the whole test be like that, of course not. But um, there should always be a, a small part of the test that really pushes students to see how, how much they actually know. And it, it was only three marks out of 64. So it was what, 5% of the test? So we're under 5% of the test. So um, by no means does this make or break your ability to succeed on the test. It just, it gives students who are, are really strong and did a lot of practice the, the room to, to, to really sh to prove, them, prove themselves. And uh, quite frankly, even if students weren't well versed in practice, all the information was, was right there for you in the question. Um, this question explains that there's a type of force we had not talked about yet called the buoyant force. And uh, we've all experienced the buoyant force. You know, when, you're, when an object is in water, um, it will feel lighter. Um, you, you've been swimming, presumably before, at least once in your life, or you know, even in a bathtub or something. Uh, when an object is submerged in water, it, it feels lighter. And that's because there's an upwards force from the water on the object. And that is what we call the buoyant force. So the question actually gave students this knowledge. That was nothing new. And we even gave you the formula for the buoyant force. We said the buoyant force is going to be rho GV, where this is rho of the liquid and volume of the object. So even, even if this new uh, piece of information confused you and you, for some reason, hadn't been swimming before, um, that really should not have impeded your ability to do the question. Because we're, we're giving you the formula, we're giving you everything, we're telling you it's an upwards force, we're telling you the direction that the force is in. So when you draw your free body diagram, we're literally telling you how to draw your, your buoyant force vector. So um, the question says, if you hang a mass uh, on a string in some water, what's the tension in the, mat, uh, in the string? So again, it's a forces question. So if you draw a free body diagram, like I advise, step number one should always be free body diagram. Um, we draw a free body diagram, we've got weight coming down. We obviously have tension coming up from the string. And the new piece of information, this is what the challenge was, um, we're telling you in the question that there is an added upward force, uh, a buoyant force from the water, so we're telling you that right in there. So even if you knew nothing more about the buoyant force, you should, you should still, students should still readily be able to draw the free body diagram for this object. And that's, that's what it would be there. And then from there, uh, as with all the forces questions, quite honestly, we go to F net equals MA. So um, F net equals MA. Um, the question specifies that the object is at rest and not accelerating. So the net force is equal to zero. And we see from our free body diagram that we have two upwards forces and one downwards force. And it asks for the force of tension. So tension is going to be buoyant force plus the force of gravity. So uh, students should have been able to get this far uh, fairly easily, fairly easily. Um, we gave you the formula for the buoyant force. Um, oh, hold on. Sorry, this should have been a plus sign, which means uh, this would have been force of gravity minus buoyant force. There we go. So students should have been able to get this far fairly easy. And uh, plugging things in, we give you the formula for the buoyant force. It's uh, rho GV. So you can factor out G. M minus rho V. And that gives you your tension. Now, we give you a little bit of information about the, the object. So you can actually calculate the, the volume of the object. We're, we're telling you it's a box. So the volume of a box is simply the side length cubed. So um, the side length is L, so L cubed. And uh, this would be your final equation. And if you plug in all of your values, I think you end up getting something like 5G or 49 newtons. Now, this was assuming you used the correct G uh, the correct row value of 1,000 grams per liter. Uh, there was a typo, a very, very small typo on the test. 
that said the density of water was a thousand kilograms per liter, which is very wrong. I mean, you buy pop, you buy pop at the store all the time in two liter pop bottles. There's no way that two liter pop bottle weighs 2000 kilograms. So um, that, was, that was a small typo, but that should not have impeded your ability to get to this formula at all. Um, this is why we have students, and I've been telling you guys all semester so far, um, it's really important to, to derive your final equations because they're not value dependent. Even if we mess up a value, who cares? The physics and the problem is still correct. So for those of you who did use a thousand kilograms uh, per liter, you probably would have got a negative answer here, which doesn't physically make sense, but that was, that was my fault. That's because you, you used the wrong row value. So you will not be penalized for that. Um, if the TA who marks this forgets to accept that as the correct answer, um, don't freak out. Just send me an email after you get your marks back um, that, you're, that the negative value was marked wrong and I'll, I'll go back and fix it. Assuming, of course, you, you correctly did the math with the wrong value. If you incorrectly did the math and got a wrong number, then of, of course it's still wrong. But um, hopefully a lot of you got my message there and you used the right row value. And that was the whole test. Uh, other than the multiple choice questions, of course, which everyone had different ones of, so it's hard to take those out. So hopefully now looking back on the test, you see that um, the full solution questions were very approachable. Um, I Honestly, I think they were a bit on the easier side compared to last year's midterm and definitely on the easier side compared to the, the examples we do in lecture. Um, I, I try to do some of the more medium to advanced questions in lecture to kind of really show you how even the harder questions are virtually done in, in exactly the same manner as the easy questions. But uh, hopefully looking back on these midterm solutions, you'll see that uh, they're not overly complicated, they're not overly involved, and that uh, everything on them should have been very accessible and, and approachable for students. So if, uh, if you, now obviously they're not marked yet, but if you walked out of that midterm feeling like it was, like you, you didn't have enough time or if it was too hard, um, I will remind you that it, it's likely because uh, you just didn't practice enough. And uh, yes, it's, it's a busy time. I mean, whether, whether we're doing an online class during a global pandemic or whether we're, it's a regular iteration of the summer class, fact is it's a summer class and it's accelerated by a factor of two, right? So every day you don't do homework, you're actually missing two days compared to, you know, in, in the regular term. The other thing that makes it hard is lectures are back to back to back. They're Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Right? In a regular term, you've got lecture Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so you've, even, you've got more time in between lectures to sort of do homework, sit down, and, and contemplate things. So, um, you know, there, there's more of a responsibility on the students end to really take a responsibility for, for their own learning. Like, I, I can't create space in between the lectures, right? I don't control when the lectures are held. I just show up when I'm told to. So, you know, you all, you all knew the information going in to this class. You knew that the class was online. You knew when the lecture slots were. Um, all that information was available before you signed up. So we, we all, myself included, we all entered this course knowing uh, what it entailed and we kind of have to just take responsibility for that. So you know if you are walking out of this test feeling like it was hard and challenging, it's you should probably be doing more homework is, is really what that means. Anyway. Um, I don't mean to interrupt. I just had a couple questions um, about some of the things that I was hoping you could address. Is that okay? Uh, sure. Uh, is it about the midterm? Yeah, it's about the midterm solutions. Oh, okay. You sure. Um, yeah, so for a couple of the questions, um, and I think other people in the in the group chat had the same issues. Um, there, where we would get the same derived equation that you did, but then the math that we were doing was coming with a different answer. So I think that was the case for uh, 12A, 14B, and also 15, we were getting. So I was just wondering if you could like double check the math on those just to make sure. Uh, yeah, now, hold on, I, I won't do it on the spot, but I'll do it after the lecture is done. Uh, what was, uh, what yeah. were the numbers again? Can you, can you say them? It was uh, 12A, 12A, yeah. 14B, 14B, and 15. And 15. Okay, I'll go back and uh, I'll look. I've, I've said very frequently in this class that uh, my calculator and I have a love hate relationship. So, um, yeah, um, and then there was one other thing for 13. 
Um, could you go over the question doing it with the three separate diagrams, just because like, I know a lot of us did it that way and it might be helpful. I know it will be for me just to see like where I went wrong doing the three diagrams. Sure. So the three di okay. So you mean, um, there is, is, um, are you able to see the, did I, did I scroll to the correct spot? Yeah. Yeah. I can see where you are. Okay. So, um, let's see, let's see if I can move. Um, the stuff over here. Gives us some room. Uh, okay. Okay. So we want to know mass C for a given acceleration. So what you would do is if you did it uh, three separate free body diagrams, you'd have to set up F net equals MA uh, three different times. And eventually, you would eliminate one variable at a time, and you'd be left with, with um, mass C at the very end. So you could start with the free body diagram of A. Um, you could say F net equals uh, tension 1 minus MAG is equal to MAA. And uh, we don't know tension 1, so you could say tension 1 equals MA, oh, I used capital A before, uh, MA. G plus A. Now we know A. A is desired to be two meters per second squared. We know G is 9.8 and we know mass of A. So we have, we, we are able to find tension one. Um, then you'd move on to analyze the second block, the middle block. And the middle block would have tension two minus tension one minus the force of friction equal mass B times the acceleration. Now it's the same acceleration as the previous block, right? All the blocks move uh, together. So the, the acceleration is still two meters per second squared. We have mass B, I forget what it is, but we have it. And we now have tension one. We have tension one from the previous analysis. So we can plug this value into there. And then we can say tension two equals mass B times acceleration plus MA g plus a plus the force of friction is going to be mu fn and you can tell that fn is just going to be mbg if you were to look at the y direction so that gives you tension two uh, if i simplified this a little bit maybe i can collect all the ma's and mb's um, mb this is going to be let's see a plus mu g plus ma G plus A, tension two. And then now that we have tension one and tension two, we move to the third free body diagram. Oops. F net equals MCA. And the net force here is going to be MCG. Gravity's pulling down. Tension two is pulling up. And this is going to be MCA. Uh, a we know it's uh, it's simply just two, so here we would plug in MCG minus now tension two is a little bit long tension two is MB times A plus mu G plus MA G plus A that's a G not an S equals MCA. And uh, we have an MC here, we have an MC here. So flippity flop, we get MCG minus A equals MBA plus mu G plus MA A plus G. And then MC equals the numerator over G minus A. So it's the same equation we would end up with uh, before. So that, that would be how you take uh, information from fr one free body diagram and eliminate a variable in a second one and then eliminate a, th uh, a second one in the, th in the third free body diagram. We've done, um, we've done examples of this in lecture when, when, the, um, when, well, when, when two objects were connected with, uh, with a pulley. I think we did a question with a table. Uh, there was a mass on a table and there was a, a hanging mass and we did two separate free body diagrams and we solved for tension in one and eliminated tension in the other one and, you know, solved for either mass or acceleration or something uh, that way. 
Okay, uh, are there any other questions? I, I will look at the values for 12A, 12B, and uh, sorry, 12A, 14B, and 15. Um, I've said often that my, my calculator and I uh, do not have a good relationship. And you know, that this is, this is exactly why we ask for, for final derived equations as well, because this way it's, it's easy to just, if you have the final derived equation, um, odds are your setup was correct and your analysis was correct. And we can give you like 99% of the points and we're only gonna take off like half a marker or something like that for an incorrect value because there's technically something wrong with it. And, and myself, I'm fully willing to admit like, you know, most of the marks that were taken off when I went through school was because my calculator and I had a love-hate relationship. And I'm fine with that. I mean, there's, there's bigger fish to fry in my life than worrying about a few marks here and there for, for value. So I'll go back, I'll double check those. Uh, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, any other questions about the midterm before we move on? Uh, let me pull up the chat. So in case some of you are, are nervous about um, unmuting yourselves. Uh, can you explain why you treated the question as if the close at the top of the drum when it's supposed to be tumbling? Can you, uh, well, if it's tumbling, you, so this is where you're, you, you kind of have to understand what the physics means. Uh, when the clothes tumble, it means they don't complete the full circle. Uh, it means they get part of the way around the circle and then, and then they fall. Uh, and when they're falling, that's the act of, of the tumbling. Now in real life, it's, it's a little bit more physics-y than that because there's, there's platforms jetting inward in the drum and there's some static friction to consider as well. We weren't considering any of that. So, um, you know, for, for a, a, an object in vertical uniform circular motion, uh, it means that it's traveling at the same speed all the way around the drum, but in order to, to figure out what, you know, what speed at which it needs to complete the circle, is uh, it's when the normal force at the top is zero. Um, at that speed, you're right on the cusp. Technically at that speed, you will complete the circle, but you know, a smidgen less than that speed uh, and it will fall. So the, the critical, I guess, the, the threshold speed would be what we calculated. And uh, that would be the maximum uh, frequency. Any, any spinning anything faster than that, the close would, would uh, continue to be pushed against the drum and then they wouldn't dry properly. And of course, slower than that frequency would be good because then the clothes would, would tumble as well. So if it's going in a full, full yeah, exactly. So if the clothes were to maintain contact with the drum all the way around, then it's, it's proper uniform circular motion uh, in, in a vertical loop, which is fine. Um, but in, in that case though, they wouldn't tumble. So uh, we want to know at what speed is, is the cusp of a falling. So that's what we solve for. We solve for when the normal force at the top is zero, because if the drum were to spin any slower, even a hair slower, then um, they would fall. And then that would be considered tumbling. So we solve for the maximum possible uh, frequency. For the third free body diagram, why is it not tension to minus force of gravity equals MAC. We have to look at the, these are all vectors uh, and um, the acceleration of block C is downwards. So if you wanna make down positive, which is what you've done, right? You said equals it positive MAC, where it's not negative MAC, it's positive, or not MAC, sorry, MCA. You said it's equal to positive MCA. So inherently you're making down positive. And then on the left-hand side of your equation, we know from our free body diagram, tension is up and, and um, and weight is down, force of gravity is down. So on the left-hand side of your equation, you're contradicting yourself. You're saying up is positive and down is negative. So you're mixing two different coordinate systems in the same equation, which is, it's incorrect. So um, if you wanna make down negative, by all means, you can make down negative. So then you'd say uh, tension two minus force of gravity C equals negative MCA. Um, or if you wanna make down positive, you could say, you know, F FGC minus T2 equals positive MCA. Uh, was the density, why was the density not cover, converted from this in the last question? Uh, it was, I think, Kelly. Um, I mean, there was a typo in the, in the, um, 
in, in the test, uh, we, we said it was a thousand kilograms per liter in the test, which is just wrong. Um, in real life, it's a thousand grams per liter. So I put kilo there by mistake. And, uh, but I mean, numbers are numbers. Um, if you used, if you used um, the incorrect value, if you used a thousand kilograms per liter, you'd get a negative number for, um, for your Newton value, uh, much larger than 49 as well. But um, the typo in the value of rho should not have affected the derivation of the final equation. So, you, you know, everyone should have the same matching equation, but uh, I will check. I will check the value, but um, I'm uh, Kelly. I mean, if it was a thousand grams per liter, wouldn't you use one kilogram per liter to calculate? Uh, yes, yes, you would. Uh, I, I, I'm agreeing with you, so I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why that's a question. I did that and got 59 instead, instead of 49. I'll, well, I'll look at it later. Um, I'll add that to my list of values. 16, you got 59. Um, you might want to, well, I don't know. Uh, make sure you convert between cubic meters and liters because they're not the same. One cubic meter and one liter is also um, not the same as one another. Anyway, I'll, I'll look at it. Again, I, I've said many times, my calculator and I do not, not have a very good relationship. So this is why it's important to have equations because equations are not subject to what the values are. Um, for the gun question, uh, the diagram and the actual worded question have different target distances. I think your answer used 0.15 kilog uh, kilograms or kilometers uh, in the distance, but our test used. Oh, so maybe that's where the difference came from. When I made the diagram, I made the diagram in PowerPoint. Uh, 45. You're right. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's what did it. We had the same, yeah. For some reason, when I made the diagram in PowerPoint, I just, I labeled the distance completely wrong. Not sure why. Yep, not sure why. I think your answer used this. Yeah, that, that's gotta be it. So I'll, I'll go back and I'll fix that. Thank you. Okay, anything else before we move on? To find the uncertainty of V squared in question 12a, uh, can we calculate it as V times V and use, um, no. I can see why you might wanna do that. Um, so we didn't teach where these formulas came from. Uh, we just kind of showed you what the equations were. And uh, the equations come from statistics uh, and correlations between variables. So if you have a stats class, you'll know that you know, a lot of assumptions and stats is the variables have to be uncorrelated. These equations that we gave you for propagating uncertainty um, for multiplication, like x times y, assumes that there's no correlation between variable x and variable y, meaning they're different values. However, if they're the same value, like x times x, there is a correlation between the two, uncert uh, the, the two, the two values. So um, there's a, there's a, if you follow the math, there's, there's a different equation to propagate powers. But the power equation was given to you in the chart. Um, and you had to use it in, in the uncertainty assignment for t squared. And you also had to use it for the lab for t squared as well. Um, I, I think you skipped my follow-up question, so I'm going to type it again. The question asks for the maximum frequency that will allow the clothes to tumble. So that doesn't that mean it's not going, so that it, it's not going in a full circle because that's how I interpret the question. Yeah, uh, it, that is, it's the, we're looking for the maximum frequency so they do not travel in a full circle, but that is the frequency we solved for. I mean, technically, it's slightly less than that value, but I mean, it's, it's the least upper bound. It's a continuous function. So you solve for the frequency at which the, the normal force at the top is zero. And, uh, you know, you, you, you can't go faster than that. So technically, I mean, we got, what, 0 0.88 hertz? Like, what's less than that? 0 0.89999? Well, I could go 9999999. Like, there, there, there is no... There's no way to answer that precisely. You have to just say it's 0.88. It's the, 
it's the least upper bound. For question 15, uh, if you did it in a different way and got the same H, will that be marked correct? Well, yes, as long as the, the other way you did it is physically correct. Um, as you might know from math class and calculus class, um, there, there's many ways to get the right correct answer, numerical answer, but um, that doesn't mean the steps you took are, are necessarily correct. So as long as the steps are correct, the TAs will evaluate the physics of what you've done. And as long as the physics of what you've done was correct, then yes, you will absolutely get full marks. Uh, and the value of H is, yeah, yeah. Okay, anything else before we move on? No, we can always chat about this later. Um, I think we've dwelled on the midterm enough. Uh, I will go back and look at those values. So, um, you know, there, there is that. Um, Adam, no problem. I, I always like to take some time and go over the midterm because every single year in every single class, whether it be summer or otherwise, students always walk out of the midterm, um, you know, having felt good beforehand and shitty afterwards. Um, that's nothing new. That's not new this summer and it wasn't new last year. It's just, happens every year. So I always try to make sure I, I carve out some time and I go over this because I, I do want to, midterms are not to, to put students down. They're, they're not to, to say, you know, you suck, you fail. Midterms are supposed to evaluate your learning and nothing more. Hopefully after we went through the solutions, you realize that there was nothing super tricky about them. It, they were all, you know, a very, very appropriate questions that we've covered in lecture. And I was just trying to see how well students have studied and, and retained and learned the information. So I don't want to just forge ahead uh, having everyone lost, right? Because everything builds on, on things, especially in physics. So I always try to take time and I go back to make sure we're all on the same page to make sure everything's clear. Because if, if, you're, if your foundation is mud and you build a house on mud, the house is going to fall down. So um, it is important we understand the basics before we move on. Okay, so for those of you on YouTube, I'm going to stop the recording shortly and we're going to transition into some review problems. We have about half an hour to do some review problems from energy. So it'll be a separate video because um, it's a, a technically a different topic. So that'll be all for this video.